Hey, good evening. My name is Maria. I want to welcome everybody to uh, the Wednesday night Bible study. Um, I posted this on Facebook, but I'm just giving you a heads up. Our live streaming is still down, so we are recording this. And as soon as we wrap this up, we're going to try uploading it to Facebook. So we're going to be a little bit delayed in posting it, but um, not by much. And I just want to encourage you to tune in and make sure you listen to tonight's word. Um, it's going to be a heavy word uh, and a fresh perspective on the mind of Christ. Um, I tell you, uh, God spoke to me so powerfully about this, and I feel unworthy to be teaching this because I, I myself have a very difficult time executing the things we're going to be learning today. But it's a learning process, and with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can go through this transformation together. So before we get started, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to lead us and to teach our hearts. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. It teaches us, it instructs us, um, it, it trains us up, and it, it um, shows us, it illuminates the pathway to heaven, that narrow road. But we cannot do it alone, Lord. We need the Holy Spirit to do this changing in us, to do uh, what, what we can't do on our own, because the things that you're asking are deep and they're heavy and they're not natural to our flesh. So I pray, Lord, that even as I share this word, Lord, that, that it would be your words coming out of my mouth with, with power and with conviction. And I pray that anybody who hears it will be moved, God, just like you moved my heart. And that we would together walk towards a path of righteousness and, and a, a way of doing things that's pleasing to you. I thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's hot in here, isn't it? <laughs> so... Um, I wanted to say, we've talked about how the goal of the Christian life is transformation. Um, we want to be transformed into the image of God. And we must trust the Holy Spirit to do this massive working in us by yielding to his ways, to his wisdom, and to his will. And when life gets tough, God encourages us not to waste those hard circumstances, but instead to ask him to use them to transform us more and more into his likeness. And as I've shared before, the transformation process is absolutely essential if we are going to enter through the narrow gate <clears throat> into eternity with God. And as we're going to see today, God leaves no provision for the sin nature. Only Christ-likeness guarantees us our inheritance. And that seems so simple as a concept. We all seem to know it, but as we read what God requires, we realize this is really quite a heavy lift. So if you're a Christian today watching this, you may think to yourself, like, no, I think I got this. You know, I think most of the time, um, you know, I generally do things God's way. But the more we read scripture, we discover that God's ways are so different from anything that feels natural to us. It seems like it's a 180 degree shift from what feels normal um, and how we feel to naturally handle certain circumstances in life. And the funny thing is Jesus was pretty famous for ruffling feathers because it seems like he was always showing people, including the religious leaders, um, how different we really must be. Uh, how different we must think and how different we must act in order to be considered true sons and daughters of God. So today I want to take an excerpt out of Luke and take a glimpse into the mind and heart of Christ. This is going to be the entire chapter 6 of Luke. So let's turn there together. Now you'll find similar accounts of this of these teachings of Jesus, you'll find them all throughout the Gospels. There, um, I'll cross-reference some in Matthew as well, but I really enjoy how this is worded by Luke. Luke was a doctor, by the way, so he has a an interesting way of recording how things happened. He's very um, well-spoken, and I love to read anything that, that Luke documented. So at the beginning of chapter 6, it talks about how Jesus was um, hanging out with his disciples on the Sabbath. Let's um, start reading. It says, now it happened, verse 1, now it happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields, and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, why are you doing what is not lawful to do 
on the Sabbath. So, you know, I read that and I thought to myself, gee, aren't they so critical? But if I put myself in their position, they understood the law of God and they tried to do everything that pleased God. So they thought that they were going to be the gatekeepers and the police and say, no, nope, you're doing this wrong. Um, and Jesus has a very interesting answer for them uh, in verse 3. He says, but Jesus answered them and said, have you not even read this? What David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And he said to them, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees here, they're demonstrating kind of a religious spirit. No flexibility whatsoever. This is right. This is wrong. And they cast a judgment about it. But Jesus is trying to teach them a different way of looking at it. He says, look, it's not about having a religious spirit. It's not about being unyielding. He's trying to say the law is put into effect for a greater purpose. The Sabbath is there for us to rest, not to get nitpicky. But if somebody's hungry or if somebody's in need, you don't not help them because the law says such and such. So Jesus is taking what they believe and he's kind of shifting it and he's showing that he's not so rigid. He's not rigid. He goes right to the heart of the matter because it's interesting the line that it uses here in verse 4 it says which is not lawful for any but the priests and still um, king david wasn't judged for what he did because they were hungry and god understood that and god wasn't going to be a stickler with a religious spirit now he continues um, you know the story here continues it says in verse 6 now it happened on another sabbath also that he entered the synagogue and taught and a man was there whose right hand was withered. So the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath. Again, they're watching him closely, like the police, trying to condemn um, and, and having such a strict religious free, uh, spirit without the freedom in the spirit. So he says, um, he, they watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath, that they might find an accusation against him. Now, it's interesting because who is the accuser of the brethren? Satan, right? And so they, instead of in trying to, to do the right thing, they're really being used by Satan because all they want to do is accuse Jesus of wrongdoing. They're trying to catch him in something. And it says in verse 8, but he knew their thoughts and he said to the man who had the withered hand, arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. And Jesus said to him, to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy? This is what he was trying to, to tell them. He said the law is not about following every tittle of it. The law is about the spirit of it, to do good on that day, to, to put Christ first on that day. Um, in verse 10, it says, and when he had looked around at them all, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. And this is what, I mean, I've read this stuff so many times, but it's never popped out like this to me. In verse 11, it says, but they were filled with rage. You know, this really convicted me, I have to tell you, because I am built in such a way where I hate injustice, absolutely hate injustice. And I will fight tooth and nail to try to bring justice to a situation. And if something happens that is unjust, I mean, you look and see what's happening in the news. I have a very hard time watching the news because a lot of what's happening in my spirit feels like this ain't right. This is wrong. And the injustice eats me up alive. But you know what it does inside of me? Sometimes it fills me with serious anger. And so I thought, I didn't think anything of it. Because I thought, well, this is righteous anger. This is, this is anger from injustice. And then I looked at this and I thought, wait a minute. Is this a religious spirit, this sense of injustice that I have that is so... Um, unyielding, that it causes anger and sometimes rage inside of me. And so I, I, I feel like the Holy Spirit made these verses literally pop right off the page to say, Marie, you can't have 
a religious spirit. And even if it doesn't feel right, I have a different way of dealing with things. We'll get, we'll get to that in a second. But let's continue to read. Jump over with me to verse 12. It says, Now it came to pass in those days that he, meaning Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. I read that and it blew my mind. I don't know how many of us have been up praying all night. And I don't mean like, you know, laying down with our eyes closed and praying. I'm talking on our knees, interceding, praying, seeking God all night. That spoke volumes to me about how Jesus made decision because guess what happened right after? It says, and when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose 12 whom he also named apostles. So Jesus knew he had a major decision to make, and he spent all night in prayer. Uh, there's something really powerful to be learned here about how, uh, how God likes for us to do things. And the other thing that really kind of, this is kind of as an aside, but, you know, when we think about the disciples, we only think about the 12, right? But Jesus had a lot of disciples, and out of them, he chose 12 to be those closest to him and those he also named apostles. So I thought that was kind of interesting because the rest of the disciples usually followed along with them. If you jump over with me to verse 17, it says, and he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples. That's all of them. And a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits, and they were healed. Jesus' heart was always to set people free. In verse 19, and the whole multitude saw <clears throat> to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. I would venture to say that the reason power went out from him is because he spent all night in the presence of God. Do you remember when Moses spent that time on the mountaintop in that intimate place with God, his face shone, power went out from him. And it was the same with Jesus. And so it makes us think, man, if we spend more time in prayer, would we emanate more power to heal the sick, to be more effective in, in delivering people from strongholds, from demonic oppression, etc.? So these are just the, the opening lines. But here Jesus sits down and he says, all right, I'm going to teach you some principle, some principles. And what's interesting to me <clears throat> as I was reading this is I thought everything he's saying here is he's teaching us about the economy of heaven. You got to understand, we have the economy of this earth, meaning we have a certain way in which we know things happen here right? Certain set of unspoken rules, or we call it etiquette. You know, we shake hands when we, when, you know, somebody does something wrong or a crime, they, they get arrested. There's a certain economy of what we expect to do things on this earth. But there's also an economy in heaven. There's a way that things are done there. And I don't know if you ever think about how are things done in heaven, but I think we kind of assume that things are done in a similar way as they're done on earth. But Jesus here is saying, uh-uh, they're not done in a similar way at all. And he's saying, even though you live on earth, and even though you live with the economy of earth, I want you to live on this earth, live out the economy of heaven. Because you need to be a transformed person so that you fit into a place like heaven. I don't know if that's making sense to you all, but let's look at some of what he's teaching us to do. And you'll get to see just how counterintuitive it is to what we know. So verse 20 says, then he lifted up his eyes towards his disciples and said, blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Immediately I start thinking there's what we go through now. And what we're going to reap in heaven. Many of us don't think of it like that. You know, you think you're going through struggles now. And even though Jesus promises us great things in heaven, you're like, yeah, but I don't want to go through this now. Right? But Jesus is saying, listen, if you are poor now, 
the reward for that is going to be riches in heaven. He's saying, if you're hungry now, you shall be filled in heaven. Blessed are you, and this is interesting, the word now, because that word doesn't exist in Matthew's gospel, meaning it's not worded like this, and I really like how Luke worded it. Um, he said, blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh, and the implication is in heaven. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. And listen to what it says in verse 23. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great. Where? In heaven. I want you to hear this, how backwards things are. He's saying, um, blessed are you when men hate you. You're like, I don't like to be hated. And when they exclude you and revile you and talk poorly of you, um, and speak of your name poorly because of me. He said, blessed are you. And then he says, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. He's, I'm literally getting a visual. He's like, yahoo. Which one of us has that attitude? Yahoo. I was just persecuted. I don't have it. But he's telling us to be that extreme, is to jump for joy whenever we face these trials because our reward in heaven is going to be so amazing. So he's trying to get us to think about not this earth, but to think about what happens in heaven. He says, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. Verse 24, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. This is pretty powerful. I think about Hollywood. They live pretty nice, don't they? They have these amazing homes with this amazing furniture, just anything you can dream up, backyards that look like resorts. And I think sometimes to myself, like, man, I wish I could enjoy something like that. But what Jesus is saying is they're enjoying this reward now. But because you're not, your reward in heaven will be even greater. So he's saying to me, don't be trying to be rich on this earth, because if you are, you'll already receive your reward here on this earth. And the reward here on, on this earth is so small, it pales in comparison to what God has prepared for us. So it, it puts in our mind and in our heart a desire to say, I don't care to be rich. I don't care if I'm persecuted. I don't care if I'm poor in spirit or if I'm, or if I'm sad or if I'm lonely or if I hunger now. Because I'm looking forward to how that is going to be compensated to me in heaven. Amazing. It's really amazing. Verse 25, woe to you who are full, for you um, shall hunger. He's saying those who are full now, those who are living large on the yachts, he goes, you're getting your reward now. But someday you will hunger. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now. For you shall mourn and weep. They laugh now. They're having a good old time. But without the Lord in the life thereafter, they will regret it. They'll mourn and they'll weep. Verse 26, woe to you when all men speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. I look at politics and I look at Hollywood award shows. Do you know those shows make me so sick? Because all they do is they exalt one another's filth. Everything vile that they believe in, they exalt one another and clap for one another and make themselves feel good over things that they're going to cry over um, when Jesus returns, when we stand before him. So he says, woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Verse 27, but I say to you, who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Let's stop right there. I don't have natural love for my enemies. And the last thing I want to do to an enemy is to do something good for them. What I want to do is I want to put them in their place. Because in my sense of justice, because in my earthly economy, 
that's the right thing. When someone does something wrong and they're an enemy and they're attacking, the right thing, the just thing is you want to put them in their place. You want to see them held to account. But God says, not in my economy. He says, I want you to do good to your enemies. Love them. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. Have you ever been used? Isn't that an awful feeling? To know that somebody's taken advantage of your kindness. And he says, pray for those who spitefully use you. Verse 29, to him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. Is he serious with this? I know we know these verses. I know we read these. And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you do that? I, if I'm being truthful with you, I would have a very hard time doing that. If somebody strikes me on the cheek. I'd probably want to strike him back to defend myself, right? That's just kind of the natural inclination. But Jesus says, stop fighting and stop defending yourself the way that you internally want to do. Be humble. If somebody wants to take advantage of you, let them. Say what? <laughs> that is not natural to me. <laughs> so he says, to him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak or who robs you, basically, do not withhold your tunic either. Somebody comes to rob your home, takes away something valuable from you. Would you say to him, hey, wait a minute, I think you forgot about the ring. It's in this box. I wouldn't. But Jesus says, don't hold tightly to the things of this life. If somebody wants to take your stuff, give it to them. Can you imagine that? That's totally unnatural to me. It says, um, and from him, ver, uh, verse 29, and from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. Don't be stingy. If somebody asks you for something, give to him or her. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Has anybody ever borrowed something from you? Yeah, can I borrow that? And then you never see it again. He says, don't worry about it. Don't ask for it. Just let him keep it. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And verse 31, and just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Now, the whole taking of goods and giving back, I, you know, in certain circumstances, I'd be okay with that. But you know when I'm not okay with that? I've had friends in the past who have had siblings who never seem to have enough. My friends are humble, but their siblings take advantage of their parents and take and take and take by the thousands and thousands, and they're, they're demanding and, and entitled. And when someone has that attitude, and I read this verse, and it says, um, and from he who, he who takes away your goods, don't ask, do not ask for them back. I'm like, but Lord, they're taking advantage. They're entitled. They don't deserve it. And God says, that's okay. You let, them, you let them keep it. See, my sense of justice, I'd be right here, back here where the Pharisees are. And they were filled with rage because it just isn't right. But that's not the attitude that God wants us to have. Verse 32 it says, but if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Have you ever tried loving someone who absolutely cannot stand you or who's doing harm to you? That's a very difficult thing. Verse 33, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Now, this is you know, loving somebody, that's kind of an internal thing. But doing good to somebody who's intentionally doing bad for you, now you got to bring yourself to actually execute some sort of act of kindness to people who are not kind to you. This to me, as I'm reading it, I just sense, like, my gut tightening. Because I think to myself, how does God expect me to do that? I, that's very difficult. This is great in theory, but putting this into practice is extremely difficult. It says, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? 
That doesn't count as credit in, in God's economy. For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? Do you hear that? When somebody says, can I borrow $1,000? And you say yes, you expect to receive it back, correct? Hence, I'm lending you the money. You may even have a payment plan established. But God says, I want you to hear this. Um, for, okay. And if you lend to, the, to those from whom you hope to receive, okay, well, I think I need to go back. In verse 33, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? Meaning if somebody says, can I borrow money? Here's $1,000. Keep it. Because God's going to reward me in heaven for that act. Did you ever think about it like that? I don't think about it like that. I think to myself, like, sure, when do you think you can pay me back? <laughs> right? That's, that's normal to us. And Jesus says, uh-uh, don't ask for them to pay you back. It says, for even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But God wants us to be different than the unbelievers. Verse 35, but love your enemies, do good, and lend, listen to this next part, hoping for nothing in return. Hoping for nothing in return. Let me paraphrase that. Here's $1,000. I hope he doesn't pay me back. Does anybody ever think that? Here's $5,000. I hope he doesn't pay me back. That's not natural. Nothing about that is natural. But look at what he says. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward, where? In God's economy, will be great. And then you will be sons and daughters. I'm adding the daughters part of the most high God. He says, you want to look like God? You got to do these things to look like a child of God. And here's the best part. And this verse got me to bawl my eyes out as I read it. It says, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. But Lord, it ain't right. They're taking advantage. It's not right. They're entitled. They don't deserve it. Well, if God is kind to the unthankful and evil, and all of us have fallen in that category at one point or another, then who are we to be unkind to the unthankful and evil? That blows my mind. I'm, I've read this so many times, even in preparing for, for tonight, and my head is starting to understand it, but still the application of this seems almost impossible to me. For some people, it may not be as difficult because you're just built more like Christ. <laughs> For me, apparently, I'm built like a Pharisee, and it's a painful thing to see, but God wants us to be built like him. Verse 37, judge not, and you shall not be judged. I want you to think about churches. Isn't this kind of the great downfall in most congregations? Drama. And how does drama come? We judge one another. Did you see what he said? Did you see what she wore? Did you see how they did this in the church? Who made this decision? And those judgment sow seeds of discord and not unity. And that's the downfall of any church that's struggling. And so he says in verse 37, judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Man, hard to forgive people when, when you've been really, really hurt. It's very hard to let go of that. Verse 38, give, and it will be given to you. And, you know, I used to attend a church where every time we prayed for the offering, we would recite this verse. Give and it will be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. We always used to declare that. 
but it's interesting. You kind of have to see it in context. It says give, and then it will be given to you. Be generous, and it will be given to you. Lend without expecting to receive, and it will be given to you. Live in this economy. Love your enemies, and it will be given to you. And so this formula for press down, good measure, shaken together and running over is true whenever we're generous. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Pretty interesting. If you're a small tither, you're going to get small back from God. If you're a big tither, you're going to get big stuff back from God. And I really probably shouldn't be using the word tithe because it's not even a matter of what you give to the church. It's how generously you live. It's what you do for the work of God. And it's not even stuff that has to be documented as a write-off. It's a way of life. For with the same measure that we use, it will be measured back to us. Do you know that that's not even referring just to financial measures? If you give... If your measure is being judgmental, it will be measured back unto you. God will judge you. If your measure is to be condemning, it will be measured back unto you. If your measure is to be unforgiving, it will be measured back unto you in the same manner. And so you read these things and you think to yourself, how could I continue being unforgiving, ungenerous, judgmental? Because God says, listen, it's going to come back to you. I don't want that to come back to me. That's why it says, do unto others also as you would like for them to do unto you. Verse 39, and he spoke a parable to them. And he said, can, a blind, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Do you know what he was saying here? He goes, don't follow the blind leaders. You're both going to fall into a ditch. But follow Jesus. He's saying, follow me. You are my disciples. I am your teacher. You're not above me. But everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Let me ask you something. Isn't this the purpose of Christianity, of what we do? Our goal, as I said, is to be transformed into the image of Christ. Our goal is to be perfectly trained so that we could be like our teacher. And our teacher is mapping out for us right here what he's like. So if we're going to be transformed, and if we're going to be um, made like our teacher, we have to be able to do the things that are written in here. Verse 41, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? So easy to see other people's problems, isn't it? I'm guilty of it. And it's very difficult to be introspective. But Jesus says, look, worry about yourself. You worry about being transformed. And then you can inspire others to be transformed. Verse 42, or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye. When you yourself do not see the plank that's in your own eye. You don't see it. Hypocrite. Yikes. Yikes. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Verse 43, for a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its fruit. I tell you what, if we look at what fruit Jesus is talking about, oftentimes we think about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. But can I propose something? Everything I just read, those are also fruits. Living generously, loving your enemies, lending freely, those are also fruits. And Jesus is saying the entire world will know you by your fruit. Do you look like the rest of humanity or is there something that is so unusual about you that it stands out? Because all of these ways that he's suggesting are extremely unusual. Uh, verse 44, for every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. <clears throat> and a good man out of the good treasure of his heart 
brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Do you know our fruit reveals what's in our heart? This is actually one of my favorite verses. I quote this verse a lot. My friends know that. They actually go, you know, when I start to quote it, because I quote it that much. But out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, you cannot hide what's in your heart. It will always be revealed in your speech. Whether it's complaining, whether it's murmuring, whether it's talking bad about people, whether it's judging, whether it's condemning, it's always going to be revealed in your speech. And so that's why God says, worry about the heart. Because when the heart is good, the whole rest of the body is good. The stuff that comes out of the mouth is life and not death. Verse 46, and now this is, this is kind of the pivotal verse of this teaching, for me anyways. Jesus says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Do you know, all of us here, we call him Lord. Lord, can you do this for me? Lord, Lord. He says, why do you call me Lord, and you don't do the things I say? And I read this, and it just brought me to tears, just because when you read this, what room is there for disobedience? What defense would we have before God when we say, well, Lord, I, I was in church. I led worship. I did. I worked many years. I was in ministry. I went to the prayer meetings. I taught the Bible studies. And do you not think Jesus would look at me and say, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you didn't do what I required you to do? All these other things you did, they don't impress me. In fact, I want to show you, I want to cross-reference this because a lot of this is spoken about in Matthew. Um, and you can read it between chapters 4 and 8. But I want to go to Matthew 7, verse 21. It's, it's, it's an extension of this verse that I just read. Y'all know this, but I want to read it and break it down for a minute. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name, and I will declare to them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Let me break this down. Who is he talking to here? I would venture to say he's talking to mature Christians. Because they prophesied. I mean, a mature Christian would be expected to, to do that. They cast out demons. That's pretty impressive. You've got to be a mature Christian to do that. They did many wonders in his name. Again, I bet you the, all these people thought that they were right with God. Because look at the, the works that they're doing in the name of Jesus. And he says, I, I will declare to them plainly, I never knew you. De depart from me. What? You who practice lawlessness. What is lawlessness? It's disobedience. It is not doing the things he says. It's, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I say? That's lawlessness. And so you may think to yourself, well, I don't murder. I don't steal. I don't, you know, I don't do any of these major things. Yeah, but do you love your enemies? <laughs> do you do good to those who hate you and who use you? Do you lend without hoping not to, to get anything in return? That's what Jesus is saying. He says that's how you're going to be sons and daughters of God. And that's when he'll open the, the narrow gate and say, come right in. But those people are surprised. They're going to be very surprised. And I tell you what, there's nothing more sobering I can preach to you or to myself, than to say, Lord, let me not be one of these people who is misled thinking I'm right with you, but all along I have been practicing lawlessness and disobedience. And why do I say disobedience? Right in the beginning it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Not our will, the will of my Father. 
This is deep because after reading this, we can ask ourselves, do I fit the bill? And I went through the check marks and I said, no, 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 no. I was honest with myself. And I fell on my face and I just cried and I said, God, I'm willing. But you're going to have to do it in me. And I think that's the prayer we all need to pray. These things seem simple, but they're really not. Because they go against our sin nature. They go against everything that seems right to us. But God is saying, you don't have a choice. Just like he said to Nicodemus. Remember what he said? Sell everything, give to the poor, and come follow me. And he couldn't do it. Let's not be like Nicodemus. Let's obey God, no matter what he asks of us. Because he says, look, don't hold tightly to any of this stuff. It doesn't matter. You have no idea what I have prepared for you and how I'm going to reward those who did the will of my Father. I just want to read one last verse, verse 47. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house that dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against the house and could not shake it. For it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the streams beat vehemently and it immediately fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Listen, I hope you've listened with an open heart and that you're moved by these things. And I hope that you'll crack open your Bible, read this in all the various versions that it's offered throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and study it and pray for it every day until you feel that you've accomplished this because God is pleased when we do these things even if it doesn't seem right to our flesh. Amen. We want to be known as sons and daughters of God, not holding on to our own way, but saying to God, whatever you want, Lord, it's yours. And so uh, I'm going to close this out in prayer. And we're going to, we will stop the, the recording in a little while after the prayer. And then please join us um, praying with us from home. But we're going to be praying tonight. We're going to just ask the Holy Spirit to do these changes in us, to do in us what seems difficult or even seemingly impossible for us to do on our own. So, Holy Spirit, I thank you. I thank you for revealing the deep things of the word to us. You're showing us things that we could not understand on our own. But you're answering our prayers. Our prayers are always to be to, to make God pleased with us, and you're saying, you want to please God? This is what you need to do. And I pray that, uh, that unlike Nicodemus, that we wouldn't walk away from this saying, I can't do this, this ain't me. But instead that we can say, I can't do this on my own, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask you to do in us what seems impossible because we're willing. And we invite you, we invite you to change our mind, to change our hearts, to change our intentions, to change our uh, point of view, and that you would give us the point of view of eternity. Do this in us, that we may be sons and daughters of the living God. We thank you for these promises and these revelations, and we'll honor you with them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Please listen. Join us in prayer as well. Share this with someone. This can save a life. Thank you so much. Have a great night.